Okay. Now, I think that's live. Just keep in mind there's about a 10-second delay. So I'm just going to check online that that's working. Everybody smile. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> all right i've just got a notification and i think we're here so guys if you're on youtube and you can hear us give us a hi hello in the comments section ignore my children in the background <laughs> and i'm pretty sure we're live now so i'm going to hand over to our host for this evening and i'm going to mute so you can't hear my kids <laughs> Thanks. Fred. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Salazar. If you like what you hear today, please use the hashtag New Teacher Tribe on Twitter. Um, now I'd like to introduce my awesome co-host, Chris Dodds. I met Chris in 2018 when he shared with me his passion for supporting new teachers. Uh, he created an, a booklet on, on research-based classroom management strategies. That's awesome. He attended a New Teacher Tribe uh, to New Teacher Tribe events and spoke at our free New Teacher Tribe conference. He's just an awesome human uh, who really believes in supporting and empowering new teachers. Over to you, Chris. Oh, thanks, Steffi. You're an absolute legend. Uh, look, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I really want to. Uh, I really want to thank our guests that we've got here tonight because, as I said earlier, they could have been anywhere in the world tonight and they've chosen to be here. So. Um, I really want to thank our guests, who we will introduce a little bit later on. Um, the reason we're here tonight is essentially Steph and I were having a bit of a conversation, as we do, because um, when we talk, we really talk. Um, and we thought to ourselves, we're in a very privileged position being teachers um, in the fact that we have secure employment and, you know, we have jobs that, uh, that we love. But uh, there are some people in our community, especially our pre-service teachers and our beginning teachers, who don't have that luxury. And there's a lot of uncertainty, especially with the COVID-19 uh, situation that's currently unfolding. So we thought to ourselves, what can we do to actually, you know, not fix the problem, but how can we support our beginning teachers and our pre-service teachers? And, um, you know, Tonight's presentation, tonight's uh, meeting isn't, we're not here to solve all of the world's problems. We can't, okay? We really can't. But hopefully what you gain from tonight's uh, Teach Meet is the fact that the vast majority of teachers across Australia are supporting you. Um, we have your back and we will support you in any way we possibly can. And that's why we're here tonight, essentially. We, we wanted to uh, formulate a... Uh, a meeting with a whole bunch of expertise and and we boy we've got that tonight so um you're very privileged to be uh with uh, amongst amazing human beings with uh, this teach meet but um yeah so hopefully uh you can gain some advice hopefully you can gain some good ideas but we just want you to know that we care and we are empathetic towards what you're going through in these uncertain times so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw it back to Steph. Now, Steffi does not need an introduction, but she's going to get one anyway. Um, this is Steffi Salazar. She is my co-host. She's an incredible human being, an assistant principal at John Purchase Public School. She initiated the uh, New Teacher Tribe. Uh, look, if you've worked with Steffi, you know how amazing she is. Uh, she, grab she brings people together towards a common cause, and, and that's why we're here tonight, essentially. So... I'm going to throw the reins over to Steffi, my partner in crime, um, and she's going to introduce our panel very, very briefly. I'm handing it over to you, Steph. It's all yours. Thanks, Chris. I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, I'm going to get the presenters to introduce themselves. Uh, but before that, I would like to send apologies from um, Cindy. Uh, she gave me permission to share with you that her mother passed away, so she's very sorry. We send Cindy all our love and all our strength. Uh, Susan, hopefully she can join us, but she is having some technical issues. So, Beck, could you share with your, uh, us um, a little bit about yourself and one awesome thing that has happened during COVID, even if it's a personal thing? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Beck West. So many know me online from Talk and Chalk, but if you work with me in the Department of Education, you know that I'm a Deputy Principal Instructional Leader this year. It's my 18th year of teaching. Uh, so bit of time there and I've been in big schools, small schools, uh, but the biggest thing I like is uh, sharing and working with other teachers. 
some amazing things have happened during this COVID time, but the best thing was probably my kids both learning how to ride their bikes. So now that when I go for a walk, they can go for a bike ride as well. And that, that's been a long time coming for various reasons. It's not something we've ignored as parents. It's just not happened quickly. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Beck. We're so happy to have you here tonight with us. Uh, yes, so over to you. I don't think you've clicked unmute. Sorry, thanks, Beck. Um, hi, everyone. Really great to be here. And thanks to um, all of our hosts and uh, all the people behind the scenes as well. Um, mine, I'm actually in a relieving head teacher mentor position at Rudy Hill High School. It's my 10th year of teaching um, and I'm also in a role as teacher ambassador for the New South Wales Department of Education. And uh, I love supporting new teachers. One of the best things that's happened, um, I'll share a professional one, has actually been leading our induction group online and really looking at modeling new ways of working with them and learning from them. And so I just, yeah, I think it's great to also just recognize to all of our new and pre-service teachers that are joining us this evening that you have so much to offer. And you know, don't be scared to share that as much as being able to support it because it's really been one of the best things that's actually informed my practice. Um, and it's just been a really, really great experience. Thanks, yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna pass it over to Sammy now who was so kind and um, she's a colleague of mine and um, we, I asked her to step in very last minute and she was super keen. So over to you, Sammy. Hi, I'm Sammy and I'm in my second year of teaching at John Purchase Public School. I teach year two. And something that awesome, awesome that happened during this whole COVID um, uh, pandemic is I'm really enjoying spending time with my family and really looking after my health. So um, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm really taking that uh, for granted sometimes. So it's great. Thanks, Sammy and Natalie. Hi everyone. I'm Natalie. I'm in my final year of university, studying to be a primary teacher. I'm also majoring in computing. One thing that I've really enjoyed from COVID is also hanging out with my family. We've been having some discos with my siblings, so that's been lots of fun. Awesome. Um, did you want to, Natalie, go into some questions that you have? You, I know I spoke to you earlier about a few of the uncertainties that you have and questions you have in this weird time. Yes. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your event. I'm so blown away to be part of a panel with such renowned educators. So along with other pre-service teachers, I'll be completing my placement this year. Um, being on PRAC, there are lots of demands, but this year with COVID, there's an extra layer of uncertainty that has come. Um, it would be great to hear the other panelists' insights into your expectations for pre-service teachers and beginning teachers, and also some information about the structure of online teaching and learning, especially as teaching goes back to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Uh, how can we expect, if we're going on placement, how can we expect our placement to be different this year? On top of this, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I've boiled it down into three main topics. So firstly, the structure of teaching and learning. Are there certain things teachers can do to help their students transition back into full-time teaching? And are schools focusing mostly on the well-being of their students or are they focusing on catching up students academically? If it is this second point, um, is literacy and numeracy, are they the focus of teaching and learning or is it um, different outcomes? I've heard that Nessa has said that this year the outcomes, all the outcomes don't need to be met. So I was wondering what sort of outcomes are schools mostly focusing on? Secondly, if COVID does take a turn, and we have to go back to online teaching or a mixed method of teaching and learning. Uh, does teaching online, is it structured differently? I feel like a lot of the feeling of uncertainty is based on adapting to change and feeling prepared for this change. 
it would be great to hear your opinions on um, on teaching students online and at home at the same time and whether behaviour management strategies are different. I've been very grateful to have previous placements that where the students are still have an impact on me today. In saying that, there have been lots of challenges along the way. If we do have a bad day, are there certain people that we can turn to for support and advice? Or are there people that we shouldn't turn to for ideas and support? Um, I feel like it's one thing to be stressed and another thing to be overwhelmed and even burnt out. Do you have any tips on recognising these signs and responding to being overwhelmed? I think how we cope during COVID and during any time is based on how we define success and measure it. In your eyes, what would a successful pre-service teacher or beginning teacher do to leave a positive impact on their students and schools? And how do you define success? Uh, back over to Steffi. Wow, Natalie. Um, you can obviously see how our pre-service teachers are feeling right now. A lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Obviously, Natalie, we can't answer everything tonight, but we'll do our best to kind of Im embed our responses through the, uh, the questions tonight. Um, I'm going to ask Susan, if you're, if you're with us, to introduce yourself and maybe uh, respond to you some of Natalie's questions if you can. Yeah, thank you, Steffi, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks to the host for organising it. I'm sorry that you probably can't see me at the moment. I've just had the most unbelievable tech fail and uh, flummox that I, I've had for quite a while. So um, it's nice to finally join. Um, I guess just to encapsulate uh, the first question and, and pick up on something that Natalie said, um, Probably my biggest highlight during this whole COVID pandemic is being forced to go online. I'm a very uh, non-technology enabled educator and person. And um, I went into education for the face-to-face -face aspect of it, not to be online. And uh, for me as a teacher educator, I've really struggled with the whole online uh, delivery and design, but it's also provided the most incredible learning moments um, within the last sort of since mid-March when the university um, sort of stopped all face-to-face -face offering and, and paused and everything moved online. Um, so, so my big moment has been I've learned a lot in a short space of time and although I still have uh, amazing technology fails, um, I'm not quite as intimidated by it as I was. And for me, I know that everybody else is learning too. And I guess, Natalie, um, knowing that I know we have a lot of pre-service teachers in common, um, for those of you who don't know, I work in the Initial Teacher Education Program at Macquarie University. Um, from my contacts who are in schools at the moment, um, who are ex range from early career through to very experienced, um, it's a learning moment for all of us too. This is new for everybody. And as a pre-service teacher is about to go out on professional experience, um, I'd say know that you're learning alongside them too and that perhaps you may be able to assist some of the teachers who are struggling with an online delivery and an online design and the whole sort of uh, flux of people being sometimes in your classroom and other times not. Um, and just be prepared to be flexible. And in the words of uh, a scholar who I admire the work of a lot, Tony Lachlan at um, New South Wales University, it's be prepared to move away from the script. You know, that your best laid plan for your lesson may not actually be able to be delivered as you are expecting in these times. And that's okay because we're all in that situation and it's a learning moment for everybody. And as a, as a collective, it's something that as long as we can be open about it and honest and say, this is working for us and I'm struggling with this, have you got any advice? Then I think it'll be okay. Thanks, Steffi. Thanks, Susan, and you're such a great model, you know, 
cooking food and to join us today, even though all these tech fails are happening. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I know you work with a lot of the pre-service teachers at, at Rudy Hill. Would you mind sharing your responses to Natalie's questions? Yeah, it's, um, no, I actually lead our induction program and we've got 11 first year teachers this year and um, we had about the same last year. So we have quite a, a large number and um, of course we're looking forward to welcoming some final year pre-service teachers as they come in. Um, I think we've got some coming in just in a few weeks actually. And I think in terms of um, learning online, this has been a big transition in terms of managing not just the online learning, but also trying to get access and resources to students who may not have that means at home. And, you know, there's been great, great support from the department with dongles and devices um, being issued. Um, but we've basically been, I think, um, Susan as well, you know, I've, I've heard Tony Lachlan speak about don't, you know, don't follow the scripts. And um, the biggest thing is to be adaptable. And I think that's one of the best things that I've actually seen that our first year teachers have um, thrived, um, even though it's not the first year they would have imagined. Uh, it's, you know, people are just like running with it, they're asking support, but the biggest thing is working collaboratively. And so even in designing lessons, we've had, I'm in a secondary school, I've had subject teams really being more collaborative than ever before. This has been the most collaborative period of my teaching career and I'm almost going into 10 years. Um, and so, you know, within that, I think lesson design is really, really important. And going on, going into practice, when you're speaking with your mentor teachers and things, I think, you know, that's that's going to be similar to the way that you would normally have those conversations with lesson planning. The delivery part as well is something that you'll be negotiating in this new environment. Um, and to, to tackle that question of is it academic or is it well-being, you know, it's absolutely looking at well-being um, to be able to we start the day with that. Um, but also I, I have an HSE class. Um, it's just been announced if you're in a secondary context that, the HSE is still happening. Um, it's a week later, but if you've seen the timetable, it's actually more compressed for students. So that's what the students at our school in terms of their mix of subjects have found. Um, so there is still that that pressure with students to meet, meet academic curriculum as well. And I think that's where it's just remembering as well that to be able to, um, I guess, like work with students at this time, that a lot of it is about reassurance. It's about motivation. It's checking in on how they're going. Um, and relationships are key as people often say in teaching, to be able to, to, to do anything. Um, but I really think that the, the lesson design and asking questions and really seeing how you can offer support um, to teams as well is going to be really, really helpful to schools. And I know that schools like ours are really looking forward to having you here. Thank you. Chris, when you're ready. No worries. Um, Look, Natalie, you brought up a lot of things in terms of well-being and, and in terms of how you're feeling in this particular situation. Um, I want to throw it over to Beck, if that's okay. Beck, I guess my question to you is, what are you doing personally to, I guess, enhance your well-being and making sure that you are, are coping with the current situation? But I also want to expand that question a little bit further. You're working with a whole range of colleagues and there are people relying on you. How are you helping others to ensure that their well-being is looked after? Well, remembering that crazy can happen like that. When my son comes to get a good night kiss right at the moment, I'm ready for a question. So <laughs> that's always handy. I think the, the biggest thing that we need to remember is, is even as adults, we're all different and we cope in different ways. And we need to remember that as leaders too, as even though we're all grown ups, we're all qualified, you know, we all adult in our own very special way, we still need to target points of needs, even with our teams, you know, for whatever is hard for me is a different hard for someone else. And we all have our different coping strategies as well. So, you know, whatever I recommend as a coping strategy is just what works for me, that doesn't necessarily mean it works for someone else. So I can't just sort of brush my hand and say, I'll go do yoga like I do. And then that would work. So I think in, in terms of well-being of staff, we need to take that exact same approach. And especially with our leaders as well as recognizing that even those, those that sit sort of, you know, above us, the principal and the director and everything too, they need our support too. Like just because someone sits at a different, you know, level or pay scale or something like that doesn't mean that they've got this any easier 
than the rest of us. You know, my, my principal still needs support. My director needs support just as much as the teams that I work with, my staff, you know, right down to even the people running our canteens and the, the stress level that they're going through in having to manage different systems and priorities and changing practices. And, and that's their livelihood. That's their income just as much as it is for us as well. So I think that's probably the best approach in terms of managing that well-being overall, that well-being focus for our teams. Yeah, look, 100% agree with you there, Beck. Um, look, thank you for that answer. That was um, that's a solid answer. And I, I guess, like you said, one size doesn't fit all, you know. Um, and dare I say it, it comes down to relationships. We just need to know the people we work with, and you know, show some empathy and and try and understand what they're going through at this particular time. Um, so, Sammy, I'm going to throw it over to you. You're in your second year of teaching. Well done for getting through your first. Good job. Um, again, what are you doing in this uh, at the present time to sort of look after your well-being? How are you coping? What are your strategies that you're implementing to get you through? Yeah, so for me, um, time management is a massive thing. Um, I really value it and I don't think in my first year I, I valued it as much uh, in terms of I just I think in your first year um, you just assess how much work you actually have to do and then you kind of work out how that fits into your time schedule. So being a new teacher there's always so many things you want to try and with even online you, there's so many things that you want to try through this online programs and everything but it just comes down to the point where you do little bits by little bit you make a to-do list and if it's not important, you, you know, do them until it's absolutely necessary. And yeah, just changing your mindset, just making sure that you're positive 100% of the time and that you have your hours that you work and you stick to them and you stick to your list that you have to get done. Yeah. I think that's good advice for everybody, not just uh, teachers in their second year. So look, Sammy, it seems like you've got an awesome personality. I've known you for a couple, you know, about what, 15 minutes. So uh, um, just keep being positive. And I think that's part of it as well, trying to be as optimistic as you possibly can. And, you know, you're doing a smashing job at that. So nice one. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw it back over to you, Steffi. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Beck and Sammy, for your responses. I think one thing I love to do to make sure my team is okay is just checking in. Um, even sending new texts to new teachers, sending them like a, a quote or a little graphic saying, you're doing great. And they just, some of them just reply and say, you know what, I really needed that today, Steffi. Like, thanks heaps. Um, and then when people check in with me, it really changes everything for me. I just always want a parent or a, a new teacher or a colleague, the principal says, thank you, Steffi, you're working so hard. I see you. You know, it just makes me like full of energy again and want me to, and it just makes me want to work even harder. And um, another personal thing, I love to light candles. <laughs> um, they just make me feel like I can do it. Everything is good. <laughs> um, so now this is a bit of a selfish question, but I'm sure new teachers are interested too. I'd love to know what home learning looks like in your context. I'm kind of used to mine, but I'd love to see. Uh, Beck, what does home learning look like for you? So we were a little bit... I don't want to say ahead of the game, but we were prepping. We were ready for things to kind of go crazy and we started making packs to go home. So just printed learning packs and we were literally scouring all of the shelves for guided readers, home readers, good quality, bad quality, anything that we could get into packs. And we knew that our, our community is very low socioeconomic, so we just had to chuck as many pencils and dice and counters and things in there as possible. And we spent that time that the kids were using those books at home to then start upskilling our staff and using Google Classroom to make that transition. I know some schools were ready to dive straight into the online learning format, but we weren't at that point. And technology was a huge barrier for that. Um, and as soon as our leaders said, hey, you can get technology into homes, we went, yes, devices out to the homes as fast as we could get them, accessioned and borrowed and everything, of course, and contracts signed. But that was quite an exciting moment where we could see in our heads technology suddenly being in the homes of those kids that had never had it before and it's quite exciting and it even brought our teachers excitement level on board a, li a little bit too where they could go okay all right if the, if the parents and kids can do this we can do this as well and we can jump on board so 
that's when we moved into the Google Classroom format. And obviously, we, we tried to keep a lot of consistency as much as possible, knowing that parents would be calling each other and saying, hey, my kid's doing this task and I don't know what to do. And at least that way they could support each other through that network, because we know parents do rely on each other for that network as well. So we tried to keep things as consistent as possible. And it just meant that a lot of our kids, the, the, the vulnerable families, those high needs families, it was phone calls pretty much trying to touch base. So we had our community liaison officer. I'm using past tense already because we're going back to school next week. So community liaison officer, our Aboriginal education officer, uh, our community languages teacher, all those people also helping with translating, getting on the phone and even liaising with those third parties like FACS or those support agencies to help those families because in a lot of those contexts, our parents weren't confident and they needed, you know, just to know that we were there or at least on the phone. And then obviously those families needed the, the home work as well, the, the learning pack, sorry, to go home. We did try and stick to our scope and sequences as much as we possibly could, obviously with that heavier focus on English and mathematics and trying to integrate those other areas. And obviously, like we said before about Nessa saying that, you know, the expectation for curriculum has changed. Uh, being in the context of the school that I'm in, it's an early action for success school. So our priorities are literacy and numeracy. So we didn't want to detract from that just because of the changes that happened. So that was our focus. And obviously there's kids that didn't necessarily work to the best advantage that I shouldn't say work to the best advantage. There were barriers. There were still barriers for all of those kids, but we've have had some kids really thrive and show us what they're capable of in that different setting, in that online uh, platform and, and going back and forth with feedback from teachers and providing extended work and things like that. So I think it's really been an eye opener on ways that we can move forward from this and not just forget everything we've learned, which is probably the most exciting thing that's come out of this whole experience. Thanks, Beck. I can really hear from your thinking, like how much your community was really considered and involved in all your decisions. And, you know, it's just so great to hear, um, hear that you've really listened to your community, your parents, and you're, you're really reflecting on what I guess you can continue um, moving forward, especially for those kids who are thriving in this kind of environment. It's kind of exciting. So thank you for sharing. Uh, yeah, so in a secondary context, what does home look, learning look like for you? Um, similar to Beck, um, we also use Google Classroom. We've been lucky to have um, that set up and going in the school for a number of years. Um, but we did recognise that we needed to take a different approach to our seniors, especially because there was uncertainty about, I guess, assessment and HSC, especially when this started, um, which has since been confirmed. Um, so with, with our U789, we actually um, recreated, I guess, lessons that would be less overwhelming in terms of what they looked like um, with a booklet and online version in that process before the devices got out to them. Um, but we maintained consistency in the way that the instructions were delivered. So we've had a whole school instructional platform based on the Blackboard configuration by Dr. Lorraine Munro, where there's like a do now or a settling activity. Um, the learning intention and success criteria are visual um, with the expectations community to students and like an outline. And so whichever way, you know, students would come in in our regular classes, that would be up on the board and visual and used as a, a way to, to keep students on track and to come back and reflect as well. And if you make adaptions um, or adapt throughout the lesson, you know, you discuss that with the students openly as well. So we knew that we needed to keep some sort of that, that format similar to, and to still have those high expectations and follow what students wanted to do. Um, and with our seniors as well, um, similar in terms of using that, but we actually re-timetabled um, when we recognised that the regular timetable was just too much, too much screen time. Um, we weren't accessing all of our students. Our students couldn't access us because just the realities of home learning, you know, multiple people at home, their parents are working from home. Um, they just don't have a quiet place to work. And so that whole idea that you might have, you know, there's been a lot of talk about synchronous and asynchronous learning. Um, we actually moved to like a masterclass format with some optional tutorials for our year 10, 11 and 12. And we had subject teams um, delivering that um, collaboratively. And then we had remote learning coaches like monitoring the chats. And um, it was actually really, really great. So that's like what this opportunity has, when I was talking about collaboration, it let us do that. Um, of course, now, like what Beck said, we're looking at what can we take going back um, into so all students are returning next week. But, you know, with the timetable, I guess, you know, on our regular timetable as we as we look at how best to do things, we've been constantly evaluating, looking at what works, looking at how students are responding and staff are responding, and then 
um, there's been a lot of, I guess, just adapting to what works and reviewing. And I guess that's been, you know, the great thing. And we've had SAS staff, like, call, we've had, like, teams working on contacting our community and parents, your advisors. It's just been, a, you know, literally everybody has just been working on different different projects but coming together to be able to support um, the school community and all of that information that goes out. But I take my hat off to our senior exec and all of the people in leadership that have been really, like, being the ones that have filtered this down. Um, you know, even me as a head teacher, like, you know, I'm just amazed at what has been provided for us to then be able to support the people that we work with too from the very top, like, in the system um, and, and counting on colleagues too. So I think, yeah, there's... Home learning has, has given us some really great opportunities um, to see what's most important in our curriculum, which is hard to do when you've got like an HSE class. But really, when we were thinking about lesson design and what those masterclasses would be, we thought differently about how to group together concepts and sequences. And it's led to redesign of um, and, and created some awesome assessment, um, new teaching and learning sequences that we're definitely going to um, keep going into whatever comes next as well. Thanks. Yeah. So I can definitely hear from your response, like just the collaboration and the innovation um, at your school that came about because of this time. Um, those optional masterclasses with those remote coaches. I'd love to talk to you more about that. That just sounds really cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you so much for sharing home learning um, in your context. Sammy, it's your turn. Time to shine. <laughs> Okay, so we organise home learning through Seesaw. So whereby each child is given a home learning code and parents have also access to a code as well. Um, they work, um, so how they get, um, so how we know they're working and they're ready to learn is they, we post a picture, like a bit of like a roll call and a, maybe a discussion question and they have to comment um, and it, to the an answer to the question, which is really quite good because they start um, opening up conversations and interactions between themselves in the class, which is really exciting. Um, and we, what they do is they look at the home learning plan. So I'm really lucky, um, again, with an amazing leadership team, we've created this stage one website. And um, the website has resources, has links, has supporting um, like articles and everything on their videos. And the kids just open their home learning plan from the website and down the bottom of the web, um, their home learning plan, it will tell you exactly what to upload to Seesaw and what um, we like to see. Um, so they look at the home learning plan and they upload it. We've also put through um, uh, resources such as um, exemplars and videos and um, we've differentiated um, scaffolds for them and we've posted it on Seesaw, which is really exciting because um, then we can cater it per child and per need and other children don't see the scaffold, which is really quite good and motivating for some students. Um, but we do require them to post and they also have to post to um, so we can see that they're actually doing the work. But there's also like phone calls between parents and the teachers um, to ask how they're going and like it is a tough time and some parents really are struggling to do work and then trying to teach their children because I've got a quite a young grade um, and young age group, sorry, and it's really tough. And I think that just being a teacher and ha ringing them up and saying, how are you going, is the great way for parents to just be like, oh, debrief and <laughs> let you know about what's happening. But um, no, it's really, really good. And the kids are thriving with it. And I do think that especially their technology skills have gone through the roof and their ability to type things, which is amazing to see. But um, yeah, no, I think some kids have, have been thriving and others just miss the interaction between other kids in the classroom. That's what they really, really miss. So yeah, no, it's good and bad. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. I think, yes, we're definitely hitting, like nailing the digital technology is part of the English syllabus, so <laughs> tick. <laughs> um, our kids have had to learn so quickly, hey. So um, I'm going to move on to Chris now. Thanks, Steffi. Um, look, our students have had to learn extremely quickly, but dare I say it, our beginning teachers have had to learn like at double the speed just to keep up. So um, I, I just want to throw this over to Beck. Um, in terms of beginning teachers within your context, um, how, what, where can they go for support? Where, where are some places or what are some resources that they can access that will support them during these really 
interesting and unprecedented times. Um, it's, we have a few beginning teachers on staff, so we ultimately wanted to make sure that, you know, even though our experienced teachers were supported, they were ultimately um, supported because I guess if you've been teaching for 30 years, you've kind of got a back burner of resources and ideas and things that you might be able to pull out, whereas if you're sort of fresh into it, uh, maybe it might be a bit sort of deer in the headlights. Um, we tried to draw back as much as we could to the resources that were being shared with us. So the things that came from the Department of Education. So we had the Learning From Home Hub. There was lots of information being shared with our principals and on those networks. So I know Yammer was sharing a lot. LinkedIn, people were sharing a lot of information that way. Uh, Microsoft Teams, we had the staff, the, the statewide staff room. Um, don't say that 10 times fast <clears throat> on, on there. And they were just sharing a heap of resources. Um, for myself, there was instructional leader networks as well. So any beginning teachers that were there, if they couldn't find or if you can't find those things sort of on the, the intranet, um, Google is always the easiest way to find something and just add, you know, New South Wales education or Catholic system or things like that if that's where, where you belong and you'll be drawn into those things that are being presented to you from your own networks but then touch base with your supervisor and those other people the, the other people that are in your school that have access to those networks so you know if someone would come to me if I don't have the answer I've got all those other networks as well that I can jump on and ask that exact same question and I mean we've got Twitter we've got the hashtag um, for the teacher tribe and everything and, and beginning teachers and things like that and I mean if you search that tribe and search the other hashtags that go with it so if you searched remote learning remote teaching remote education you would come up with a bunch of those things and even across other social media as well. So you've got Facebook, there's heaps of teaching groups, especially ones for teaching remotely, uh, especially for um, beginning teachers as well. There's all those other groups too. And, it, and the executives have their own groups as well. So same thing for me. If I don't have the answer, I go in and I ask my colleagues if they have the answer to that. And it's good for getting clarification um, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're stepping in the right direction and not just guessing or starting from scratch. You know, there's people have shared resources. That's another great thing that's come out of this is just the abundance of resources that are getting shared amongst teachers. So I, I think the biggest thing is not being that person that goes, I'm too scared to put up my hand. And that's consistent throughout your entire career. Even me after 18 years, don't be afraid to put up your hand and say, little help, please, because that's the only way that you're going to know. <laughs> 100% and you know what you know um and and you really need to ask for help if if, if you need it and i guess uh, i asked you that question so we could give these pre-service beginning teachers um i guess an outlet as to where they can get that support from um susan if you don't mind if i could throw that question but uh i guess uh, put a pre-service teacher spin on it um pre-service teachers at the moment are feeling extremely anxious um they're mm -hmm. feeling nervous uh, where can they go for support um, it, during this, you know, unprecedented time? Yeah. Um, look, I think all of them would have a tutor or a lecturer that they feel particularly connected to um, one way or another. Um, and I guess that's always one starting point. And I know um, all universities have the campus wellbeing or, or equivalent um, that are another service that's provided. But beyond the university itself, it, it comes back again to what Beck was talking about, about your networks. And, um, you know, I, I do know from the pre-service teacher groups that I work with, there's their own sort of little collaborative groups that they've got amongst themselves that I think provide tremendous support. I mean, I'm doing my PhD as well. And... Um, one of the groups that I'm particularly connected with, um, we've got our own little Facebook group called Cat Chat and we get each other through the day just swapping our pictures of our own cats with each other and little stories and things like that. And I know that this is something we all picked up from watching um, teacher education students at uni in terms of ways that they connect with each other um, and provide support. There's also the professional associations. So for pre-service teachers who are connected to a particular subject, maybe, um, I know that a lot of the professional teacher associations are trying to mobilise some free resources and webinars and, and points of contact. Um, and, of course, there's all the Facebook groups and everything um, that Beck spoke about before. Um, but I guess it all comes back into, you know, your friends and your family and your networks and um, 
you, the people that you're traveling through the courses with and um yeah to to it, it's important to know what you know and know what your capacity is and know what you don't know so that you can start to ask those questions so that's what i've been saying to my pre teacher groups and um you know um the ones at Macquarie know that they can come to me. There's plenty, um, you know, plenty of people that they can reach out to. Um, but sometimes it's often a tutor on a very practical course that they're doing um, mm. that becomes the point of connection. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Um, uh, it, it sounds like you're providing support to your pre-service teachers, which is fantastic, and I'm sure they appreciate it greatly. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Sammy, I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, as we said earlier, you're in your second year of teaching. Um, this is huge, this whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, where are you going to for support? Where do you find solace and support to get you through? So for me, I'm really, really, really lucky <laughs> to have um, an amazing instructional coach um, who I plan <laughs> learning goals and discuss strategies on how I can achieve them. So um, during this whole situation, it's really good to have an amazing leadership team as well that you can always ask questions. I think that's the main thing. So I think like what we've been saying is you, if you don't know something, ask a question. If you're concerned about a message from a parent, ask the question. If you're concerned about a child's well-being in terms of they haven't responded or they haven't um, touched base or they've said something that is a bit strange, always, always ask for advice. And I think that's been a blessing during this whole um, online, through the online system and everything. Um, but in terms of overall, your supervisor is is your go-to as well. And I, like, as I said, my, I'm lucky to have my supervisor as my instructional coach as well, which is really quite good. And so we've been learning to set goals for us, like for yourself, so they're manageable, so you can achieve them and um, and work through them. Like I've, I think I achieved last year three goals just to um, always improve, to try and get my program where I want it. Um, and that's for me has been great because that's also cutting down some of the things I want to try and making it achievable for me to um, succeed at, at little bits at a time. So, um, yeah, no, I'm honestly, I'm very, very privileged to work with such an amazing, pe um, amazing group of teachers as well that I can go to for support. So, um, yeah, that's no, really, really good. Awesome. Thanks, Sammy. It sounds like you've got a really great instructional leader. Who would have thought? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to throw it over to you if that's all right. Um, you said earlier that you've got a lot of beginning teachers at your school. Um, are you doing anything differently uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic or is it to a degree business as usual or how are you, how, how are you helping um, those beginning teachers to cope? Um, so we actually have a program where all of our beginning teachers have got a faculty professional practice mentor as well. So we have a mentor team that comes together every fortnight with our deputy principal and principal. Um, and, you know, I help coordinate the, the induction program, but we actually have a whole, you know, a team of mentors, which is really great. And I know that um, within this, you know, moving to our online meetings, I actually found, you know, as a person like running the meeting, that it actually led to more participation you know, it's, I guess it's easy to track sometimes online and it was really, really great to see other people's ideas. And one thing that we really thought about how we could do differently was how could we manage the accreditation process? Because I've got a group that, you know, it might be the last thing on some people's minds, but I can tell you that we have a really energetic uh, group that are very, very keen to, to still get that going. And we've created some amazing evidence in this period. Um, you know, people have like shown innovation, they've shown how they're meeting um, the standards in a whole bunch of different ways. So even with teacher professional learning, we thought about, well, what can we do synchronously? So when is it that we actually want to come together and we're still having like a meeting fortnightly in turn when we did it weekly um, as, a, as a group with the, the first year teachers? They're having more one-on-ones with their faculty mentors, any other support that's needed. Um, Microsoft Teams has been great, you know, to just have like chats going, um, you know, multiple like team chats going with the mentors and the faculty and myself helping some second year teachers finalise their accreditation as well. So... I think it's really made us think about what professional learning can we, you know, we have a schedule for and, you know, um, you can do in your own time. So one of those things has been supporting our first years as well. And we actually, we recommended this before this all happened, 
was to complete the Google Certified Educator modules. Um, and if anyone's interested, they're free to complete and you can actually do the exam and it costs ten dollars um, and you can you know, do the first level. And so that's something that we thought, well, we had actually scheduled that in part of our sessions initially for people to work through. But we realized, well, that's actually they, they, you know, they said they'd like prefer to work it on their own pace. Some of them are coming together and doing it together. But it's made us rethink, you know, when can we really make that time when we want to connect um, and bring everyone together and, and make that work towards the goals that we're working on and, and having professional learning around the things. And, and we, you know, we did a feedback survey at the end of term one and we're trying to constantly just see how it is that we can meet the needs of our um, beginning teacher team. And so I think there's a lot of lessons in this, even in terms of the way that we run staff meetings and have participation and what can be done um, offline with encouragement or like one-on-ones and where it's really, really valuable to really have a, an awesome group and that energy come together as well. Oh, thank you so much. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, look, the professional learning that has been on offer uh, over the past few months has just been incredible. And I, I've said it to quite a few people. Um, this is probably, you know, some of the best PL we will ever get, ever. Um, it, it's just been incredible. And some of it has been forced. But, you know, dare I say it, uh, I think good things are going to come of it, um, which is fantastic. All right, Steffi, I'm going to throw it back over to you. Thanks heaps. I've really personally enjoyed professional learning online. We've had Simon Brooks um, creating and fostering a culture of thinking with like 40 of our staff online. You know, we're all silent and we're all chatting online, share, building on each other's thinking. And I was like, wow, if we can do this online, you know, imagine what, you know, what we can really do in the classroom. So um, I ran a, a workshop for new teachers in my school on how to create a virtual classroom. I jumped on the Bitmoji tribe and now my stage has a virtual library i think we have an author's room now i think we're going to create a dance room because every time i ask my team to send me bitmojis they always send me the inappropriate ones <laughs> sammy knows what i'm talking about so yeah a lot of awesome professional learning um who can you go to for ideas support and guidance look at these presenters tonight obviously you know chris and i chose them for a reason these are awesome people to connect with um they're all on twitter except sammy but I think Sammy's going to get on, right, Sammy, um, because of our awesome Teach Me. But please connect with these people. Uh, these are the people on Twitter. They've got, they're always sharing ideas. Beck hasn't really promoted her awesome videos and channel that much, but, you know, her videos got me, my team through home learning, especially those handwriting videos. So thank you, Beck. Um, I want to come back to Natalie now. You know, you shared with us your concerns, your questions at the start of the chat. Um, what are some reflections you, you've had? What, uh, I guess, what has resonated with you and perhaps what has surprised you from tonight's Teach Me? Thank you so much, everyone. I feel a lot more reassured that we're all in the same boat and that it's really great to hear of the mindset of teachers as learners and always learning ourselves to better our practice and to collaborate with our teams um, it sounds like that there have already been lots of good things to come out of COVID. So collaboration and all the resources. Um, so that's really great to hear. I was surprised how many people, like different stakeholders, communicate with each other, especially from what you were saying, Beck, before how everyone's really willing to get on board to assist all the students at home in their learning. So that was really good to hear as well. And thank you for all your tips on, um, on the transition back into the teaching um, full time, face to face, um, and all the resources as well and where we can go to. So thank you so much. How are you feeling now, Natalie? Do you feel as, I guess, confused, as nervous, um, because you're about to start your final practice? Yeah, before this panel, I was a lot more uncertain, um, very nervous and wasn't quite sure what to expect. So after this, I and hearing all the things that you're doing online, if we do have to return to online learning, it's great to hear what I could expect and how much support is out there as well. Awesome, Nat. Thank you so much. Chris, over to you. 
All right. Well, look, um, we're almost at the end of our teach meet, um, which is, and look, I've got to say, we, we've got, we've had an amazing panel of people here tonight. Um, and, and hopefully you've taken some ideas or, or some sort of thought from tonight. And hopefully we have supported beginning in uh, pre-service teachers just that little bit. But please know this. We are supporting you. We have your backs. And there is so much support out there. And uh, look, I'm, I'm not alone in saying this, but uh, I would say that pretty much every teacher out there, that's whether you've been teaching for one year or 20 years, we are supporting you, especially those pre-service teachers. I know it's a tricky situation at the moment, but we've got your back, okay? We really do have your back. So, you know, keep on keeping on. Ask for help. Okay, ask for help. That's really important. Like we said earlier, you only know what you know. Okay, so don't be afraid to ask for help. It is out there if you ask for it. Um, I want to thank everyone watching at home. Um, thank you. you. Like I said earlier, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here and you're listening to this wonderful group of people. So thank you very much for coming along tonight. Um, look, if you would like to, uh, more information, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. So as we said earlier, the New Teacher Tribe has a hashtag. So what is it? Hashtag New Teacher Tribe. I'm sort of new to Twitter, so I'm sort of learning the ropes myself. But uh, new to hashtag New Teacher Tribe. Follow us. Um, there's all sorts of resources. But as Steffi said earlier, every, uh, pretty much every panel member is on Twitter. So if you want to get in contact with them through Twitter, please feel free to do so. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've actually done pretty well for time. Um, before we finish up, I can't hear you, Chris. <laughs> Was I on mute that whole time? No, but you said before I finish up. <laughs> <and> then... <laughs> oh dear. What I was going to say before I accidentally pressed mute was, um, did anyone have any words of wisdom before we finished up tonight? Anything just to, to end this wonderful teach meet on? Susan? Um, I just wanted to share a, a little quote from something uh, that I read earlier this week. And it says, in the absence of the familiar, what possibilities does this open up for a different future? And um, it was written by a group of geographers who were exploring the academic discipline of geography and geography education together. Um, but it really made me think about education more broadly in all that we are missing and don't have at the moment, yet all the new things that are being created, you know, and it really forces you to ponder the question about, you know, what we're going to retain and what the good things have been and, and what is important about education. So I think um, the, the absence of the familiar yet seeing it as an opportunity to create a different future was something that really resonated with me this week. So that would be my parting words, if that's okay. Thank you. And they were, they were fantastic parting words, Susan. They were great. <laughs> did, anyone have, did anyone else want to throw their hat in the ring in terms of some words of wisdom? Um, I just wanted to say in terms of well-being, um, I think sometimes um, people can be a little bit afraid to say that they're struggling, but that's something that you should be really, it, it can be daunting to do. I myself, you know, was in that position as a beginning teacher. Um, but if you're feeling overwhelmed, like, you know, there's all these strategies to go, to, go for help. But um, being honest with your supervisor and just letting them know, you know, if there is something else going on, you know, it can just help you talk it through and how to manage your position as a teacher Whatever might be going on personally, that's something I learned the hard way. When something difficult was happening to me in my personal life, I felt like I just couldn't manage my professional life. Um, and that was something in terms of teacher identity. So I think that's something that you really learn, like as a pre-service teacher and as a beginning teacher, to separate, I guess, your position um, and your person. And they overlap so much in our jobs, which is why, you know, we, we love doing what we do. Um, but that's something that really, really helped me and continues to help me now as a leader as well. Awesome. Thank you, Yasser. That, that, wise words. A absolutely fantastic. Um, anyone else? We've got like a minute or two left. So did anyone else want to throw their hat in the ring? 
I'll jump in there. That's the story. <laughs> uh, I think the one of the ultimate things that we can do reflecting on this as well as remember, we just got through a worldwide pandemic mm -hmm. in our country. A pandemic, like zombies I've imagined, <laughs> not a pandemic actually coming to our shore. That's just my movie brain. I mean, really, that's one of the best things that we can use for ourselves and even for our kids. We got through a pandemic, guys. We can do this. We can do this race. We can do this spelling. We can do this writing. You know, this is easy compared to what we already just went through and just kind of bring that mindset back to the, the positive growth instead. So, you know, as much as our, you know, parents or, or grandparents or whatever, you know, we had to get through a war. Well, we've got our own one now <laughs> that we can reflect on. <laughs> And, that, and that's a fantastic way of putting it. We, we've actually gotten through this. Well, we hope we've gotten through this. Well, we hope we've gotten through the worst of it, fingers crossed. Look, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we'll call it a night there. Um, thank you very much once again to our panel members. Thank you to those people watching at home. Um, like I said, hopefully you've gained something from our Teach Meet this evening. Um, like I said, uh, hashtag new teacher tribe. Um, Please feel free to contact any of us via Twitter, um, especially the people that are on Twitter. Um, we'll leave it at that. But thank you all so very much. And uh, we'll hopefully see you very soon. Good night, everyone. Thanks very much. Good night. And...